The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no, no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what he had, they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be seated, please. It was about eight or perhaps nine years ago that I went on, we went on a pilgrimage uh, to Georgia in the Caucasus Mountains in the far, in the far east of Europe. And at one point, we took a ride up what they call the Military Road. It was a road built by the Russian Empire when it first, in, when it first invaded Georgia uh, in the 18th century. Uh, they built a road, uh, and it, essentially the same road, much better paved now, I'm sure, but it was still a two-lane highway. And at times, as you looked over, as the bus swung around very sharp curves, it was quite, well, it gave you pause. <laughs> and we were glad that there wasn't much opposing traffic on the road, since the Russian border at that point had been closed for some accident or other. Um, and so we drove within 13 miles of the Russian border, actually. We got to this village, and our, our tour guide had said, now tomorrow we're going to, we're going to go on a six-mile hike, so everybody better come with stout pair of shoes. And on the, uh, that morning, as we waited in the village square, and someone said, well, in what direction is the, the, where, you know, the place that we're going, the monastery, it was a monastery that we're going to see. And she said, six miles up. <laughs> and it was. By a series of switchbacks, we sort of wandered up the, and got to the top. Now, when you get to a top of a mountain, you can see why the monks might have been, you know, lured to put a monastery there. Because, first of all, it's a wonderful view. I mean, you have to, you know, and it sort of broadens your whole perspective of just looking down and looking around and seeing things. Plus the fact that it's so daunting to get up there, the monks wouldn't be bothered by a lot of people who didn't, you know, were, for frivolous reasons, wanted to come and visit the monastery. So, it was, I mean, it was something you had to set out to do. It wasn't easy. But there it was on this mountaintop. And mountaintop, a lot of the monasteries there were built on mountaintops, and, and I think a lot of the monasteries around the world are built on mountaintops for precisely the reason that the view, it, it changes your view of a lot of things. And that, of course, brings us to the gospel story of, of Jesus taking with him uh, Peter, James, and John, and going up the mountain, and there they saw things differently, didn't they? That's what we just heard. They saw things differently. I mean, they had known Jesus. That Jesus came, um, uh, you know, he pro after his baptism in the River Jordan and a stay in the wilderness, he came out of the wilderness proclaiming the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is near you. You know, repent and believe in the good news. And people heard his teaching and they responded to it. He came uh, to visit, uh, to preach somewhere near where fishermen were working and called to four of them, Peter and, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and said, come follow me. 
And they'd heard enough of this preaching about the kingdom and the way Jesus did it to, to be attracted because, as other people said, you know, Jesus spoke differently than, than other teachers did. He spoke like <coughs> one with authority. He spoke like he actually, well, I put it, he spoke like he actually knew the God he was talking about. And that, if something came across that way, people understood this, maybe, maybe not at a level they could, you know, sort of verbalize, but they just understood he was, and he dealt, where he came, he brought healing. And demons, the demons that people have seem to uh, be, uh, their, 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 their lock on people seem to be broken and they fled from Jesus, they knew who he was. Jesus did all these things. He actually, you know, in, in that period that we, in, in, he actually sort of went to a wedding, didn't he, with his parent, with his mother rather. And um, when they ran out of wine, he kind of made the party, made the celebration come back to life by changing water into wine. Jesus had made an impression, and Jesus was worth following. They understood him to be, as Peter called him, a rabbi. No, they understood him to be a great rabbi. But now on the mountaintop, these three disciples saw things a bit differently. There alone, there with the, the world looking different all around them, there they suddenly saw Jesus with Moses and Elijah, those two figures that represent the whole teaching of, of, the, of the covenant relationship of God with his people. Moses who brought the, the, you know, the, the, the law from Sinai, the law by which... It, it, people lived in relationship to God. The law by which the people of God knew that they were specifically God's people, that he called them. And there was Elijah, the, you might say, the one of the chief or greatest among the prophets, the one who was so great that as we heard in the earlier story, um, when he died, he was taken up into heaven by you know, chariots of fire. And he was always thought of as being a special prophet. He represents the whole of the prophetic tradition of speaking for God and proclaiming the word of God. And there they saw Jesus in that light, conversing with those figures. They didn't quite know what to make of it. As, you know, Peter makes a, an effort to, to make something. So maybe we should build three dwellings or three shrines or however you want to translate that. And, and because he didn't know what else to say. And then they hear the voice, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. And it's all, the whole experience in a way was daunting, was terrifying, because they saw this Jesus, this rabbi, this healer, this one who uh, brought joy wherever he went, and, and um, this one who proclaimed the nearness of the people of God. They suddenly saw him as something more. They got a glimpse, if you like, of the glory of God, they, they, a connection with the one who made heaven and earth. Or as St. Paul said, you know, God sort of spoke the word, and, uh, and the one who said, let there be light, has let light shine in our hearts that we can see the, the glory of God, the creator himself in the face of Jesus Christ. And they, they, they got it. They, they got a, just, a, just a, a hint, just a glimpse of what was that Jesus was more than just a good, jolly, happy, sort of comfort-bringing rabbi. But he was more. They saw him differently. And from then on, as they go down the mountain, we hear that Jesus tells them, uh, you don't talk about this until after he's risen from the dead. And in some of the Gospels, it goes on further to say that he began to teach them then about how the Son of Man had to be uh, you know, crucified and die and rise again. And they didn't really know what to make of that and didn't really want to hear that. But that's the point. Here is a moment from the, on the hillside on the mountaintop, rather, when they see the um, glory of God in the face of Jesus in a way that they, they've not imagined before. They get it, that there's something more. You know, when, it, when all the, 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 the cloud disappeared, they saw only Jesus, and yet they recognize that here is something different, something special, something that it is reflecting the very love of God, the very light of God, and Jesus they began to see, shows us more about the very nature of God. And that's why we hear this story as we're on the, on the, on the edge of, well, it's the last Sunday of, of ordinary time, at least in the winter, of the last Sunday of, of, of the, after the Epiphany. 
and it's the, one of the great epiphanies or manifestations of, of, of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. And we're about to go into Lent, and why? Because the world we live in is a world that still understands glory in a very different way from, from what we do when we see the light of God shining in the face of Jesus. The world that we live in is the world that Jesus was walking in and which ultimately crucified him because they couldn't deal with what he was saying and what he was doing because it threatened their view of life, the view of life that we still live in the midst of. People who understand that power, for instance, is all about, it comes from, a, well, for some it comes from a barrel of a gun, for others it comes from a massive great bank account and lots of money. For some it comes from just being able to influence lots of people or just being having your ego uh, uh, rubbed by other people. This is all the views that we have uh, of, of what power is like and it sometimes leads to very distorted views of what God is like. But Jesus, in Jesus we see the, the light of God is shined upon in our hearts so that we can see the face of God in the life of Jesus Christ our Lord. And what Jesus did in the face of all those other sort of views, you might say, those, those manifestations of power in the world around us, the power of violence and bullying and brutality and wealth and, 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 and you know, taking advantage and, and pushing your weight uh, in, in all, all of that stuff. Jesus walked among it in love, in peace, still maintained a joyfulness about life but refused to give way to the lies and to the false teaching. And it led him to the cross. And it was only after he rose from the dead that the disciples, and especially those three that were on the Mount of Transfiguration, understood that real power has nothing to do with violence, with prestige, with money, with, with guns, or anything else. Real power is the power of love, because that is the power that created the world. That is the power that, that, that motivates the one we call our Father, our God. That is what really will last. All this other will, will fade away. It'll, it'll, you know, sort of, I want to say shoot itself in the foot, but that, you know, it will. It, I mean, it will fade away. And the power that lasts is the power that Jesus shows us, that we see shining in, in, as, as a light in, in our hearts because of who Jesus is. This is what will last. Mercy, gentleness, kindness, goodness, all those gifts of the Spirit that we, that we talk about, that the, that the apostles talk about in, in the New Testament, um, and that we, in a sense, as Christians, honor. This is what... This is what God is about. And all the rest will fade away over time. Although it might sound big, it might frighten a bit, but its days are numbered. We know this. And this is what, you know, as Christians, this is what, in a sense, is part of our joy, part of our hope, because we just, we recognize that that God's love will overpower everything else. It'll be the one that, because it was there, it was there at the beginning of creation, it will be there when and if the end comes, when our end comes most certainly. The love of God is the power and glory of God. Very different from what the world around us is like, which is why we hear this story on the, on the edge of our so are beginning uh, to observe Lent. When we begin with an Ash Wednesday, which, um, to, to my opinion, is the day of absolute groveling, you know, so breast beating, because this is one day when we acknowledge that we, the world we live in, is a very miserable place by our own making. Now, no, we're not responsible for every single crime, and, but we live in the midst of it, and we know, if you're honest, and this is what we hope to bring, you know, in Lent, what we hope, to bring out for people to be honest about it. We know we're capable of all sorts of nonsense and horror ourselves. But we've made a decision, I hope, that we're not wanting to be part of that world, that the world we live in is the one 
that we see in the light of God in the face of Jesus Christ, a world of righteousness and justice, of compassion and mercy and kindness, a world which, will, which is really uh, what the creation is all about, what God, the maker of all things, is all about and what he's like. This is where we live, this is where we want to live. So we go through Lent because we recognize that our world is like that. But we want it to be. And we recognize that the power of God is in this thing that others would call weakness. The weakness of Jesus who refused to give way to violence or hatred. Refused to give way to lies or bullying. But simply loved. And that's the power that will last, and that's the one I hope that we want to be part of. That was the glory of God that those disciples witnessed, just a glimpse on that holy mountain when they saw things differently. So let's look at our world as if we were on a mountain. Look at it differently. Through the eyes of Jesus, through that light that shines in our hearts to show us the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.